morning, friends. Please stand and let's just do a couple of uh, recharging exercises. Let's do the double breath, weight lifting up overhead. To the side. Let's walk in place. Feel the circulation moving, the heart getting recharged. Feel a smile coming on your face. Let's offer a prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Beloved Guru Deva, Paramansa Yogananda Ji, saints of all religions, we bow at thy feet. Divine Mother, help us to feel thy presence in this satsang. We open ourselves, body, mind, and soul to thee. Uplift us in thy joy, in thy light. Om Shanti Shanti. I'd like to read uh, words from Swami Kriyanandaji. Make contentment your criterion of prosperity. Wealth is primarily the consciousness of abundance. Poverty is the consciousness of lack. You can be rich though dressed in a hermit's meager clothes and housed under a tree. And you can be poor though residing in a marble mansion served by bustling servants, surrounded by rich furnishings, and possessing a bank account running to many millions. Another criterion of true wealth is indifference to mere opinion. You can know how rich you really are by your measure of inner happiness. If you are burdened with excessive luxury or imprisoned by the expectations of others, you will pass your life miserably indeed. Let's listen to Swami Kriyanandaji now on this topic for today of um, thinking of God, of simple living and God thinking. So today my subject is high living and simple thinking? No. <laughs> simple living and high thinking. I remember years ago when I was living in Sedona, Arizona, and I didn't have money to live on, very little, and I made sort of a joyful product out of seeing, or project I should say, of seeing how little I could live on. I found that I was able to get by very comfortably on $10 a month. It seemed inconceivable now, it was inconceivable then for that matter, but it was really quite fun. I sprouted alfalfa sprouts, they have uh, uh, eighty percent of the minerals and vitamins that you need and cost very almost nothing as seed I made chapatis that's unleavened flat Indian bread instead of bread or buying bread I would make a tortilla kind of <coughs> pie that was made with uh, um, corn flour very very cheap and be able to live on one of those for several days and dal cost almost nothing, split peas that made a very good protein and very good uh, Indian dish. And I found that powdered milk, if I could just get my mind to accept it, was perfectly all right and cost a third of what regular milk cost. And then I decided that after all, dessert is, uh, you get the satisfaction of it with a single teaspoon. And whereas if you have more and eat more, it's pleasant. Still, that lingering taste of sweetness can be quite enough. And I found that in this way, I was able to enjoy uh, a single dessert for days on end. And 
it, it was really quite fun. I enjoyed it. I was very pleased to see how little I had to uh, put out, especially since I didn't have more to put out. I found over the years, I remember living in a cave uh, on the Ganges. In fact, it's Tuesday night. I'll probably be showing pictures of that cave. But uh, living in this cave there, uh, taking my bath in the Ganges every day, it was really very wonderful living this way. I did find one further thing, and that is a point that I think that we have to more or less face in our lives here in America, and that is that to live that way took a lot of energy. So that on the one hand it was simple living, on the other hand it was pretty uh, complicated living. I would have to go from one store to the other to compare prices to get the cheaper of the two, and instead of being able to just d uh, jump into the car and go down to the nearest store and get it, whatever I needed, I'd have to make a big project of it that took quite a long time. And I'm reminded, too, of uh, Saint's answer when I mentioned how the cow, talking about diet, I said, look at a cow, how big it is, and uh, yet it's able to get it, uh, get what it needs, everything that it needs, just by eating grass. And the saint said, true, on the other hand, that's all it ever does. <laughs> and so there are two approaches to simple living. One is to live on as little as possible, but this could be made quite a project. It's almost like people who are excessively health-minded. And in their health-mindedness, that's all they ever think about. I found, moreover, that somehow giving all that attention to the body very often makes them more sickly than people who tend to just sort of eat right and forget it. But I do find that people who give a lot of attention to any particular thing, to make a fetish, in other words, of uh, diet, of simple living, of whatever it might be, spend so much time in, in the matter of simple living as the example, um, doing without, that they never really do well with what they have. And we need to somehow find a balance between those two, those two extremes. I remember one time Brother Ananda Moy in Self-Realization Fellowship was saying to Master some comparison between the virtual opulence of the uh, uh, environment that we lived in there and the life of St. Francis. And Master said, when God gives more, then enjoy it. But in other words, what he meant was, live in God and do that which will enable you to live in God. And if simple living needs to be carried to extremes as it needed to be for me in those days, if I hadn't lived on $10 a month, the other side of that is that I'd have had to go out and get a job and spend my time nine hours a day or whatever just working and tr commuting. And as it was, I was able to work on a book that I was writing, spend a lot of time meditating. And even though I did spend time on uh, keeping myself functioning, still the other choice of earning the money in order to live more uh, expensively would not have been simple living necessarily either. The choice has to be made by each one of us, and it needs to be made in moderation. It needs to be made in, uh, uh, with a sense of the society we live in, the people that we relate to. I was thinking of the life of the sannyasi in India, even in India today. It's very difficult for the Swami in India to live the way traditionally one would, would have lived. That is to say, never staying more than three days in one place, always walking from one place to another. Even in India, if you walked on those roads, the chances are high that you'd be bowled over by a passing vehicle or asphyxiated by all the smog. And if it's true there, how much more is it true here? You can't wander across the fields without being arrested for trespassing. We're living in a different society. Lahiri Mahashai was not really in favor of people renouncing the world in that way, but living with God, living lives dedicated to God, wherever they were, this was the ideal that he held up before us. Good morning again, everyone. It's so nice to have Swamiji with us, to hear his voice to see his picture, it's just such a joy. And what a great topic, 
and how wonderful he speaks on this topic, how wonderfully. I was thinking that simple living, it really has to do with openness. It has to do with space that you have in your heart, in your soul, in your mind for God. And if, if your mind is cluttered and everything around you is cluttered and you don't have time for God, you don't have space and you don't have time for the energy, for the joy of God, for um, the love of God, for magnetism, for the ideas, inspiration from God to come to you because your life is cluttered. Your mind is cluttered. Simplicity means to get back into your center, really. It doesn't mean what you have, it means what you are and what you live. And I was recalling when I lived in Nigeria, uh, I, I didn't live there, I was visiting for a month, but I lived in a hut, there was no running water, uh, there was no electricity, uh, there was uh, no phone, there was, uh, they communicated with the talking drum. And this was quite an experience for me coming out of Los Angeles and ending up there. And um, it was very, very rustic. Um, I remember even one time uh, I was carrying things on my head. You might think that's so far out, but I even learned how to do that. And uh, I found it was just very, very enjoyable because it was so different than what I was used to. But the thing that touched me the most and my memory of that experience of being there for that amount of time it wasn't that, it wasn't what we didn't have. It was the joy and the devotion of the people who were coming for the teachings. There was such a simplicity. There was such an uncluttered,ness. There was so much heart and so much love for God and so much longing. That's what I took away from there. And I remember uh, at the end of that time, because we didn't know if we'd ever be back there. I doubt seriously if I ever go back there. But um, we did, you could say, a crash course in, in everything that we do, at, that we teach. And so we offered people who have been coming uh, discipleship initiation at the very end of that month. And uh, we said, you don't have to take this, but it's up to you. Think about it, meditate on it. And if you would like uh, Yogananda Ji to guide your life and be your guru uh, in our line of masters, then you, you just let us know. And so I remember that night, and this was after day after day after day of classes and all, um, I told the people, just come knock at my door and let me know if you would like to take the initiation. It's not a group thing. And um, that night, one by one, people came and knocked at the door. Oh, and they didn't speak a lot of English, enough to understand the classes. But I remember one fellow came, and he just had such intensity and, and love in his eyes. He says, I want, I want it, I want it. <laughs> I knew what he wanted, of course. He wanted the blessings of the guru the gurus and then the next person came oh i want it too and 25 people came to that door saying i want it and that's what i re would all will always remember that depth the longing the love the devotion and i believe the simplicity that they had in their hearts was why they could see i want that and at the beginning of ananda I was, I came in the uh, early 80s, uh, 80, 81, and it was, you know, at that time even as well, it was very, a very simple life. Some people lived in a, a tent, some people in a yurt, some people, uh, there was a tree house, some people lived in a chicken coop, but cleaned out. Uh, there were all kinds of dwellings like that, and uh, cabins and so forth, and and, uh, you know, I remember there was a long line for the one shower house. <laughs> you had to wait in that line to get a shower. 
and the roads were unpaved. There was, um, in the summer, there was just dust everywhere. You just remember it was either dust or in winter when it rained, mud. Dust or mud. And you were covered with one or the other. But what I remember also from that time was not what wasn't there, but what was there in people's hearts. Who the, I mean, I saw people's, the glow on their faces and their energy level. And it wasn't that, oh, we have nothing, so our energy is low, and so it's a Tomasic life. It was such a high consciousness life. There were so many ideas and so much inspiration and so much energy and so many things that were happening. And, and uh, I remember uh, Swamiji, Swami Kriyananda he would I mean, say, oh, we're going we're gonna to take this work all over the world. We're going to go to Europe and uh, all throughout Europe we'll teach. We'll go to Australia and we'll teach there. We'll go to India. And we were just there and we believe people will look around and they go, how are we going to go there? <laughs> it was like, we just were, it was such a simple life, but it had such a dynamic seed that was planted from Master that you will go forth with this message. And the same like when with Master, when he first went to America, he stayed in very simple dwellings. He was in the uh, Youth Men's Christian Organization, the YMCA, and Dr. Lewis came to visit him there, and Master said, it's going to be big, Doctor. It's going to go. We're going to really move with this message and Dr. Lewis would look around and see there was nothing there and he just couldn't believe it. So it's not that outside, it's what you have in your heart. And a lot of people think that um, simplicity is meaning you do nothing. Uh, and you just go to the beach and sit by the beach. I have a simple life and I, I don't think about anything and I don't do anything either. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just living a simple life. And I remember someone said to me some years back, well, all you do, Acharya, is you, you just sit all day at home and chant Om. And I said, you have no idea what my life is about. And uh, the life of someone who's a yogi and a disciple of a great master is a very dynamic, a very energetic, a very inspired, a very uplifted life. And I remember a master, he saw this man who was, uh, I think it was in Sedona, Arizona and um, he was all disheveled and and uh, it, you know dirty and and he's and master said well what's wrong with you and the man said oh I'm a renunciate and master said no you're not a renunciate you're just now reattached to filth and disorder and people think that you just start looking bad and you're I'm, a, I'm living a simple life and um, Ananda Moy Ma Swamiji told us she wouldn't allow the nuns in, who were with her to dress poorly. He said, you don't need to look like that. Get proper outfits, get a proper dress, get out. She said, I'll buy you myself. I'll get you proper clothing. So it's not that you start looking disheveled. And Swamiji said he used to sometimes, because he said he just didn't know, but he'd wear you know, a torn t-shirt and when he was with you know, and Matt with Master, and he said Rajasi saw him once um, when Rajasi came to visit Janakananda, and he saw Swamiji this this kind of clothing, and he said, "Why are you dressed like that? Go change your clothes. You don't need to look like that." And so it it it's not that you look poorly, and it's not that your environment starts looking terrible. Oh, I'm a renunciate, so everything's dirty. I throw the trash on the ground, and I just do whatever I want, and. Um, Ananda village is just pristine. And I remember one uh, Swami, Swami uh, Chidananda, he came there and he, he looked around, he said, oh, it's so beautiful. Then he was taken to the gardens. And in the garden was uh, this can that was just off on the side in the garden. And, and he said, everything's beautiful, but what's that can? And people said, oh, we water the, the small plants with that. He said, well, if you're going to use that, clean it, wash it, clean it, paint it, and put it in its proper place. Put it in a place where it's always there. He said, things like that <clears throat> draw <clears throat> negative energies, low, dark entities. And so your environment should be kept simple. It's fine, but not dirty, not untidy, not things thrown all over the place. 
but should look very, very nice and well kept. And uh, also, it's not that we're going into poverty. I, I remember uh, when I came to Ananda, <clears throat> I thought, oh, I just, I, I won't be able to live that way. I mean, I'm just, I just can't imagine myself walking around with a begging bowl. I, I mean, maybe those days will come, but I just couldn't imagine and just sleep on the ground. And, and I wasn't ready for that kind of a life. And, but when I went there, I realized that it, it had to do with what I had inside. And I moved into a place, um, finally, into a very, uh, very humble dwelling. There were about I think there were seven of us in this house and I had moved from a nice big apartment and <clears throat> by myself and so I moved into this place and I didn't want to move there but I, I was forced and then by the time because of situations so then when I got there I lived in this little room with another lady and uh, I've told some of you this before but I was on the floor on a futon my head there was just no room in that room, but she was gracious enough to have me there. My head was up against the door. So anytime somebody wanted to come in, you know, oh, you know, my head was bouncing up against that door. But what I remember, I was just so happy. I just felt so fulfilled in myself. It had nothing to do with what I had. It had to do with who I was in myself. And it was a big lesson. And, and you look at all the Ananda uh, centers and the different places, Ananda Village. And I mean, that place is just, it's so, it's simple, but it's beautiful. There's 17,000 tulips there now that people are saying, you can go online and look up Crystal Hermitage, Crystal Hermitage Gardens and look up the tulips. And every place is just very beautifully done. And um, we would have rod just see Janaka Nanda days and everybody would get out and make things nice and beautiful, very simple, but very beautiful. And, you know, our center started, I remember Ananda Sacramento, just a little house. You don't have to have a big place uh, for people to come. If you have that many people, fine, but this is just very simple. And devotees came and meditated there. They had, um, the altar they called the uh, Church of the uh, uh, Eternal Religion. It was just had just very simple altar was on just furniture that was in the garage and you know with some flowers and the pictures of the gurus. It was a garage. They called it the Garage of the Eternal Religion. <laughs> but people came there. It didn't have to be big and fancy. It was what was inside that mattered. And um, every one of our places have been just beautifully done, but very simple. And um, the other thing is not to be possessed, to let go of possessed by your possessions. Master said, uh, get rid of the unnecessary, unnecessary necessities. I was saying the other day that um, people really have too much. I was thinking my neighbors, both of them, one has four cars downstairs. Of course, he's not going anywhere. And there's only two drivers in that family. And the other guy has three cars and there's only two drivers in that family. That's seven cars that are downstairs for those people. Now that's too much. And those, some of the things in your life, if you can think, now what can I unclutter of things that I don't need it? Do I really need this? Do I really need 20 pairs of shoes? Do I really need all these outfits? Do I really need all of these things? And then look at uh, what you put in your mind uh, and going online. Do I really need all to look at all of these different uh, news channels? Do I need to do social media all the time? Do I need to be on Instagram all the time? Do I need to be on Facebook? It's creating too much clutter. And if there's too much clutter, then you don't have the space to allow the divine. And I remember a story Swami Kriyanandaji told us about a man who was, uh, I can't remember where Swamiji was. It might, yeah, it was in India. And Swamiji was visiting this man and um, for tea. And he had a very, the man had a very beautiful tea set. And uh, of course he wanted to offer Swamiji tea with that tea set. 
And, um, but the thing was, he was so possessed of it, I mean, uh, attached to it, that he couldn't really enjoy it. And this is what happens with people. They're so, oh, my car got a scratch on it. Oh, oh my God, this has a, you know, and if that's all happening, you, you're possessed by your possessions. And so this man had the servant came in with the tea and while he was coming in, the man was berating him the whole time. Watch out, you're gonna trip over the rug. Run, don't, you're gonna break the tea set. <laughs> so he said, how could he enjoy it? And then after the tea, the man took away. Don't trip, you know, and, and this is what people do. They're possessed by the possessions. And so in our lives, if we can take away the things, and, it, and what I discover, and I'm sure you have too, is that as you meditate more and as you do the practices, as you uplift yourself through affirmations and chanting and reading the different books and uh, watching these kinds of talks, listening to Swamiji's talks, naturally you just look around and you say why do i need that what i remember when the lockdown first came and i had bought some groceries for the house and and then i thought well other people may not have as much as i have and i just went through all my cabinets the refrigerator and i just got tons of stuff out of there that I wasn't going to use the cook's not here. I don't really know how to cook. What am I going to do with all the spices and things? I just loaded everything up in bags. And I went downstairs and before the people could leave, I said, please take these things with you. Now that was uncluttering. And boy, I just felt so happy inside. Because if you can share what you have, anything you buy, give something away. You buy a new outfit, give one away. You buy something else, give the other away. But even in Vastu, they tell you, don't clutter your house. It clutters your mind. And then you don't have the space or the room to be able to allow God's fresh energy. If you, you know, it's so wonderful in these days, and I'm sure you have felt it too, because we're in a moment of, with the lockdown, it's a moment of more stillness all around the world and it's a moment of more quiet a moment of more inwardness and and um as i look outside it's so beautiful you see an actual blue sky in india i haven't seen that blue sky a whole lot i know you haven't either and you hear the birds you actually hear them you don't just know oh, there's birds out there you actually can listen and you hear the sweet music of the birds and you know i uh a peacock came on my balcony the other day, and has that ever happened? Never. And he stayed about five minutes, and I just talked to him. How are you? It's so beautiful. Thank you for visiting. I mean, to the little sim simple things. I remember in Ananda House, San Francisco, when we lived there, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't have much uh, money ourselves, but we were just so happy. We'd just go for a walk sit by the bay, maybe go for some chocolate. But it wasn't like, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta do this. It wasn't a complicated life. Uncomplicate your life as much as you can. And Divine Mother is helping us right now to uncomplicate our lives. Then you will find, wow, she was there all the time. I'll end with this Swamiji when we were living in Assisi. It was in the 80s, the mid 80s. It was also a very simple uh, life. And I was recalling that Master said, St. Francis, who's the patron saint of Master in uh, uh, Assisi, for sure, Italy as well, I believe, but very great saint. Um, St. Francis loved lady poverty. The Master said, oh, that's nice, but I love lady simplicity. <laughs> I just thought, yay! <laughs> Because why? You don't have to be poor to be in God consciousness. And it may even pull your, it does pull your energy down. So, but anyway, as I was saying, we were there in Assisi and, and every night, everybody, we, we all live, had our own spaces for the most part, but everybody would uh, get their harmonium out and chant and chant and chant and chant every night. There was no internet, nobody had a computer, there was no television, uh, there was nothing else to do, meditate and chant. 
and you would hear, oh, that person, oh, this person is chanting that chant. I'm going to chant that chant. Then you hear two doors. Down. Oh, I, I love that chant. I'm going to chant. It was just so sweet. And what did Swamiji say? We walked through there one night and he said, this is what I want to hear in this ashram. I want to hear people calling to God. And this is what simplicity brings you. The space, the openness, the open heart that you can call to God. And finally, you can feel him with you, within you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.